Let's talk uh, pulses. As you said, you know, we import from... In fact, when I was doing my research, came to me as a complete surprise that we import from Australia and Canada, of all places, as you just said a moment ago. Um, how are they able to produce pulses? Uh, or what are the components that goes into, say, pulse or lentil production that really makes it more difficult? Uh, what are, where are the challenges in that space? If you take lentils and you look at the yield of lentil, that is yield meaning the amount of output produced per unit of area. So in this case, kg per hectare. Sure. So if you take kg per hectare, China or Australia is having 2,000 kg per hectare plus. India has 950 kg per hectare. So our yields are half. So for every unit of land that we cultivate, we produce half what China is producing or what Australia is producing. Now, one thing about agriculture is that it is still one of the activities, we could say, which is most nature-dependent because it's out in the field and you do have now, I think I must emphasize this, with climate change, a lot of variability. So what is the temperature going to be? What are the rainfall patterns going to be? All these are changing and uh, weather patterns are changing, so that riskiness of agriculture is going up. But even putting that aside, the conditions under which we are cultivating, and there are many factors, but the low yield is because of one important reason, for example, in India is that pulses are grown largely in areas without irrigation. So these are the less productive soils as it were. So we need to pay attention to water and perhaps because there's a scarcity of water, we need to think of new ways or new technologies where we can have uh, you know, more crop per drop, as they say, to have you know, more efficient use of water. We need to also think of new seeds and varieties or cropping patterns. So I think a big lacuna in India is Research, but even more than research, I would say extension. We have very good scientists and technologists, not only in agriculture and so many fields. But is what is being done in the lab, is it getting to the person on the ground? It is getting to the cultivator or the farmer. And in fact, I remember years ago, uh, my father, when he was in the Ministry of Agriculture, designed a program called Lab to Land. So there is nothing to, what is the point of having something in the lab? That is for improvement of scientific knowledge. It's very important. But then you have to transfer it, translate it, make it in a way understandable, bring the product. So whether it's seed, whether it's a technology for water saving, whether it's a technology for new kind of input use, you have to bring the, or even processing, because very often losses or waste happens in the processing, in the storage and in, in distribution. So I think that this translation, the amount of money that India as a country is spending on agricultural research and extension is very small relative to our problem. And I think relative to the size of the problem in terms of not only the number of people, more than 1.4 billion people whom we have to feed, but also... And I think this is something that not everybody is aware of. At least 60% of our population lives in rural areas. Yes. We haven't had a census since 2011. It was 69% then. It may have come down a little bit, though we found in COVID that a lot of people went back to the villages. So it may not have gone down very much. But let's see, 60% of 1.4 billion. So that's a very... And a large fraction of that 60% are agriculture dependent. Yes. They are, I would say, they're engaged in agriculture in some way or the other. In fact, they're not all agriculture dependent. Mm. And again, that is the second problem. So we, I said pulse yield is low. And then you say, but oh, why aren't more people going and investing and doing things? Because the returns from growing pulses are very low. So when your income is low, the next generation in the farming households is trying to look for employment in the cities, is migrating, is um, 
trying to move out of agriculture. And I think this is another thing, youth are moving out of agriculture because the youth in rural areas see agriculture, say, in a, say northern Karnataka, for example, which is uh, Gulbarga district, Kalaburke district and other places which are pulse growing. It's very dry, harsh climate, hot sun, and they have to grow these pulses, very low yield, low, low incomes. So they're seeing this as so low in terms of income generation that they don't want that career anymore. So this, this is a very, very important issue, I think, because if the next generation leave, then our pulse production is going to decline even further. And how are we going to address these shortages? The Niti Ayog has recently done a report uh, called, I think, uh, it's uh, estimating projections of food for 2047. Vixit Bharat, you know, what will our requirements be? And except for rice and wheat and sugar, sugar cane, for most other crops, we if we follow a business as usual model, we'll not be able to produce enough to meet our domestic demand. And question well might be, you know, why not I can import it from Australia? What's wrong? And I can export something else in return. And here I want to say something which is, again, not associated with agriculture so much uh, when we think of it as an occupation is food sovereignty. In fact, it's very important that a country of our size, and if we want some independence in the global order, national sovereignty, we have to be able to feed our population more or less. Yes. It's not that we don't import anything or we don't export anything. Then you have a crisis, you have a war, or you have COVID, and we get isolated. You have to have enough to feed your own people. And I think that this, so declining or low production of pulses and not paying attention to it, just as an example, it can be a very, become a very serious problem. And if we again, and I think this generation of young people don't know about this, but in the 60s, before the Green Revolution, we were dependent on imports of wheat from the United States. Now, tomorrow there may be tariffs and the imports may be <laughs> but double the price. So we as a country of our size, a continent really, a subcontinent, have to be prepared for some uh, giving importance to food production. So even in the you know, this last 10 minutes, I've already picked up that, as you said, agriculture draws from many people from outside the discipline. And these disciplines, already I can see, you know, you need a, an army of civil engineers to work on irrigation-related problems. You need an army of environmental engineers that can understand the changes that are happening due to climate change and make appropriate predictive models that farmers can now begin to depend on. So I am beginning to see that the core group of, you know, food growers require an outside army of an even bigger army in some instances and a more diverse army of 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 people that can assist in this whole enterprise of ultimately becoming food secure i think the let's talk about the uh, the process by which you know engineering has come into 